first of all, uh, let me thank you for um, joining. I know uh, we are in a really busy period um, of uh, year, so the end of year period is really traditionally one of the busiest um, of all. So really um, a, a heartfelt uh, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today um, for this webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Annette Kurt. I'm uh, 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 with the ECAVET uh, Secretariat team and I will be um, your host uh, today during the next uh, 90 minutes. So um, this is actually the first uh, webinar that we do with the ECAVET um, network. So it's a bit of a new form of mutual learning that we are uh, trying here um, over the last um, two years we have made a lot of experiences with these uh, forms of virtual um, meetings and uh, uh, we thought that um, webinar is maybe um, a nice way of um, gathering information about a topic um, in um, a re relatively short time. It's a more knowledge-based um, format. Um, and what we're going to do um, in the next uh, 90 minutes is try to give you um, an insight into um, how uh, quality assurance um, in VET uh, uh, is carried out in the countries within the context of flexible learning pathways. So what does flexibility in VET mean in practice and how is it achieved um, across Europe? Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, uh, Hamad? Then we have those questions um, in front of us. Oops, no, we don't. Um, well, um, but yes, these are the guiding questions. So um, uh, uh, really what we want to look at is uh, what flexibility in VET uh, means in practice and how it is achieved across Europe and how quality can be assured in relation to the key principles um, of VET pathways, such as um, developing groups of learning outcomes or uh, micro-credentials or or uh, validation of um, learning outcomes from different learning contexts that are being transferred to another context um, that all has an impact on quality assurance. And what we would like to do is um, uh, get a brief um, insight into how uh, three member states um, are doing this. So if we go back please quickly to the agenda slide, um, then we can just to remind um, ourselves um, that uh, there are three countries that have kindly agreed uh, to present today. Um, Estonia, Poland um, and Portugal um, will share with us um, what they did in the last couple of years and how that has impacted um, on uh, quality assurance. Um, and um, we will start off with an introductory presentation that will set um, the scene a little bit and give a bit of background on uh, to just make sure we are all on the same page um, and um, know what we talk about when we say um, flexible uh, VET um, pathways. So this is uh, what we have planned for the next 90 minutes and as Hamad has already mentioned um, during the onboarding um, process, um, it is um, uh, basically a, a form, a format uh, where you, um, uh, where you, where we, we would really like you to um, to contribute, but um, it is not so much based on a direct exchange, but more um, uh, uh, on uh, putting up uh, questions um, in the chat box. And Hamad will now um, explain a little bit um, how that is going to work. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, and yeah, absolutely. So you, if you've been on a live event with me before, you probably would have thought by now, where are the technical tips? Hamad always does the technical tips, but here we are. Um, we've just pushed them slightly ahead. Thank you, Annette. And just as Annette says, um, the chat box is your best friend for this live event. Um, uh, to get in touch with us, to ask the questions, to intervene. Um, we're primarily using that as our engagement tool today. So here's a very quick just recap about some of the technical things that um, we just need to uh, briefly touch upon. Uh, again, 
Uh, for our presenters, uh, you can show it and you can hide your webcam at the relevant time. So if you're a presenter or a panelist that's going to appear a bit later on, uh, then please note uh, you've got the microphone and the camera icon at the top. Uh, for the rest of us as attendees, we've also got the chat function, which is that speech bubble. Pop that open and you can see, uh, if you click on that, you can see all of the uh, chat messages that appear. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess you can see all the other participants as well if you click on the participants list. Uh, if you've got any technical issues, uh, again, pop them in the chat box. Myself and my colleague, uh, Corrine, who's posting in there right now, will definitely be able to help you. So that's anything from seeing the slides, hearing any of our presenters, or even having any other kind of wider technical issues. Or for anything regarding the wider program, we've got equivet.mutual.learning at icf.com. You've already received a few emails from this mailbox, so just be aware that if you've got any wider questions, you can always reach out to that uh, mailbox. And uh, last but not least, uh, this event is being recorded, um, but we're intending to upload uh, the recording of this to some Equivet web pages. Um, so just be aware, it's not just for internal purposes, but we'll also be publishing this uh, to the Equivet website too. Um, but the recording has already started. Uh, you would have seen a prompt. So just be aware that this event is recorded and it's going to be used uh, for that purpose. OK, so with that quick technical introduction, just a reiteration, please do engage via the chat box. Your engagement is always very um, is always very well received and hope you have a great live session. But at this point, um, and Annette, correct me if I'm wrong, very much over to, uh, to Kuhn uh, to do a welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Hamad. Good morning. So I would like to welcome you to this ECAVET webinar on behalf of the European Commission. And so I'm glad to see that so many participants joined this event uh, today. So today we will be discussing the important topic of uh, flexible pathways in vocational education training and in particular look and reflect on how, the, how these pathways can be quality assured. So the importance of flexible pathways was also underlined in the recommendation on vocational education training, which was adopted by the Council of Ministers in November last year. Also in the updated ECAVET framework, additional references to flexibility have been added. So when we talk about flexible pathways in VET, it is useful to also look at the work produced in the context of the former ECVET instrument. As most of you know, this ECVET instrument was repealed last year by the VET recommendation, but the key principles, key principles of ECVET are still relevant and taken forward in different initiatives, such as in the updated ECAVET framework. Today in this webinar, we will use the one of the outcomes of uh, the ECVET instrument as a source for our discussions, and uh, later on we will have uh, a detailed presentation about this. So from my side, I would like uh, to thank the presenters from Portugal, Estonia and Poland for sharing their experiences, and I'm looking forward to an interesting and fruitful uh, webinar. So I'm handing over now back to Annette. Thank you. Thank you, Kuhn, for setting uh, the scene. So um, before um, we start, we would like to do um, a little exercise um, using um, Slido. Um, we thought um, that it might be useful to just um, ask you what you think of uh, when you hear the term flexible learning pathways. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Slido. Um, you can join Slido um, through your phone um, or uh, open it in your browser, typing in uh, the event code. So thank you very much, Corinne, for um, sending through the instructions uh, through the chat box. But I believe you can also use a QR reader to scan um, this little QR code here and you can join um, through this. And um, the question that we are asking is um, in one word or two words, um, what does the term flexible learning pathways mean to you? So what do you think of when you hear flexible learning pathways? 
I appreciate it's going to take a while until um, the first uh, responses are going to go through. I'll try myself. Ah, there we have the first um, responses coming in. Transferability, digital options, achieving learning outcomes. No learning is lost. Permeability, digital options, interesting that uh, that uh, comes up um, quite prominently here. Permeability and choice also seem to be um, thoughts that are recurring uh, among the participants. Modules, adaptable qualifications, learner orientation, so these are reskilling, upskilling, freedom. That's really interesting. I would not have expected to have digital options uh, so prominently here, but that is probably, <laughs> let's say, um, uh, a result of uh, the world, the ch rapidly changing world, um, permeability. Yeah, very interesting. And and I think it's also interesting that we have such a lot of different, um, uh, let's say, ideas that are coming through here. So you know that these word clouds often, um, well, very clearly show that some things are really in everybody's mind uh, relating to certain questions, but not so here. Um, and actually, we anticipated that um, a little bit, that there might be quite a lot of ideas related to flexible learning pathways. Um, so it's really important um, to make sure uh, we are on the same page and we're speaking of the same thing um, when we um, say flexible learning pathways. Um, so that is um, why we have asked um, uh, our um, colleague uh, Karin Luomi Messera to prepare a little introductory presentation on the topic just to um, help us a little bit um, to thought, uh, to sort um, through uh, the different um, ideas uh, connected um, to the term. So Karin is um, a member of the ECAVET Secretariat team and she's also a team leader and research coordinator at um, 3S in Vienna and she has um, 18 years of experience uh, with um, European and international research projects and has worked a lot um, on ECVET, uh, EQF, NQF, ECAVET and ESCO. So uh, she's really uh, the right person to help us um, uh, find our way a little bit uh, through the jungle that um, we saw there. <laughs> Karin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Annette. Uh, the next slide, please. What I would like to present is uh, just to give you some uh, more uh, information on the policy background and recent developments. Then I would like to uh, discuss a bit what does it mean to have flexible pathways. So we'll come back to the, the word cloud that we have just seen. And then I will refer to some possible quality assurance arrangements before handing over them to our colleagues from the three countries. Next slide, please. To the policy background. So the policy context, uh, actually these actions that you see here, they are all part of the European Skills Agenda that was launched in 2020. Kuhn has already mentioned the Council recommendation on VET from 2020, which is very important and has flexible VET pathways at its core and uh, of course also refers to the uh, to ECAVET. Then the Pact for Skills is also one of the actions that, that I would like to mention. It refers, for example, to flexible, flexible upskilling, reskilling um, activities. And then two initiatives that have just recently been uh, published, uh, initiated um, on the 10th of December, the proposal for the Council recommendation on a European approach for micro-credentials was published and also the proposal for the Council recommendation on individual learning path, uh, uh, individual learning accounts, which are quite important uh, for 
ensuring and supporting flexible pathways. Next slide, please. So flexible pathways, what does it refer to? I mean, we have, uh, we have seen from the word cloud that flexible pathways can mean a lot of different aspects. They can interpret it, so this, this phrase can inter interpret it quite uh, differently. And um, we have grouped these aspects here in three areas. And uh, I will present some examples, but please note this list is not exhaustive. So there could be other aspects as, as well. But first of all, I would like to start with um, flexibility in that refers to the design of qualifications frameworks, qualifications and programs. So it could refer to, for example, to overarching and inclusive NQFs that are based on learning outcomes and reference to the EQF for lifelong learning. So overarching here means that they are uh, that they cover different uh, areas, so sectors of education, general education, vet, higher education, adult education, and inclusive uh, means that they, they include qualifications that are um, from the formal system, but also they are also open to qualifications from outside the formal system. Another aspect of the design uh, features could be the existence of credit or credit transfer system. We have seen the term transferability in the word cloud. We have also seen a reference to units uh, of learning outcomes, modules that can be assessed separately. Then in some qualifications, some countries use uh, qualifications or programs that include so-called optional units. This gives the learners the uh, opportunity to choose. Sometimes there are quite many different uh, options, optional units. And this is also sometimes offered at provider level to meet regional requirements at the labor market. And then all these um, design features referring to shorter courses or to the concept of partial qualifications or just uh, mentioned micro credentials are also part of this uh, design features of qualifications. And next click, please. Yeah. From design, we come to the delivery. So delivery in terms of uh, flexibility, in terms of the place of learning, setting, the time of learning, methods of learning. So for example, we could uh, have learning um, at various locations and settings. So including the workplace, including work-based learning. Uh, we have the, in the word cloud digitalization. So online and distance learning are very important and provide uh, flexible opportunities to to join learning opportunities or a combination of face-to-face -face and, and, and distance learning. Another um, aspect could be flexible start dates. So this means that there's not only one um, certain point in time in a year in September to start a program, but uh, there are flexible opportunities to enter a program or a course. Another aspect could be part-time courses uh, that um, allow the learner to, at the same phase, study and work, for example, or take care of family matters. And another aspect refers to the learning methods, individual, individualized learning methods. So depending on the individual needs and um, possibilities, this could be, they could also be offered in a flexible way. And the next slide, please. Flexible pathways can also refer to various uh, different arrangements or we could also call them enabling uh, conditions. For example, and this is also what we have seen in the word cloud, uh, they refer to, could refer to transfer and portability of learning achievements. So in the national context, but also across borders horizontally, so between qualifications or programs from the same level, and vertically, so the term uh, permeability was also mentioned. Stackability, I think I also have seen this in the word cloud, so the accumulation of credits and to flexible, in, to build the qualification or program uh, in a flexible way. And this is then also closely linked to the recognition of prior learning, prior formal learning or also including the validation of non-formal and informal learning. 
Another uh, aspect of flexibility refers to alternative uh, access opportunities to qualifications and, and programs. So quite often we have uh, a set of certain um, qualification requirement or some other requirements, often from the formal system for entering another qualification or program. But this could also be um, the access requirement could also the access Access could also be possible based on the validation of uh, work experience, for example. Then in some contexts we find so-called dropout certificates. So this uh, gives recognition of uh, the partial completion of VET programs. So this is something that uh, those who drop out of programs can keep with them and uh, hopefully then in a flexible wet pathways can use this uh, to, to show that they have already achieved uh, certain learning outcomes and then they can use this probably uh, for re-entering another course or the same course but at, at another time. Reskilling and upskilling opportunities of course um, they are important in this context. Individualized and tailor-made learning offers and very important uh, support structures. So the, the learners for in order to make use of flexible pathways need to be supported. And this can refer to support in the documentation and recording of learning achievements with uh, documents, with uh, um, databases, for example. It also refers to the provision of information. What are the opportunities? What are the possibilities for flexible learning pathways? Guidance and counseling uh, is very important here. And of course, also funding structures. And in the next click, you will see the, that this all needs to be quality assured. And the next slide, please. Kuhn has already referred to the eight principles for supporting flexible pathways that uh, were developed by the EasyVet Users Working Group already back in 2017. And as you all know that EasyVet uh, has been abolished, but the principles are still there and they are um, also in the VET recommendation. And I don't go through all these eight principles now, but just would like to um, refer to the eighth one which refers to quality assurance. And these principles, they cover more or less uh, the aspects that I had mentioned earlier, but the eighth principle refers to the process for development, assessment, validation, and recognition of sets of learning outcomes should be transparent and underpinned by quality assurance. So quality assurance is a really uh, important issue here. And the next slide, please. So this, um, the aspects that I have presented earlier and also these uh, three areas, they usually do not exist in isolation. So they, uh, uh, the aspects of flexible pathways, they can be considered separately, but in reality, they usually overlap. And so one country will focus on, on, on this aspect or on this uh, set of aspects or on another, but also the quality assurance arrangements will um, look at the combination of these aspects or um, at certain uh, certain areas. Next slide, please. And here just some some examples of quality assurance arrangements uh, that can be used uh, to ensure the quality of flexible pathways in of the design of delivery of assessment, recognition, certification, awarding of qualifications. So for example, a quality assurance arrangement could be the use of common standards for the definition of learning outcomes and for assessment, uh, setting assessment criteria. And I believe that this is something that we will then also hear in the presentation from, the, uh, from Poland. Then another aspect could be the accreditation of unitized uh, learning, informal learning, or also now the from the new proposal on micro-credentials, uh, quality assurance of micro-credentials. Micro this is something that uh, is currently being developed in Estonia. And this is what we will hear later, a bit later. Then uh, quality assurance of validation of non-formal and informal learning, something that you will hear more about in the Portuguese presentation. 
Then uh, quality assurance of including qualifications obtained from outside the formal context in the NQF. Quality assurance of CBET providers to ensure that they comply with national quality criteria. And again, we will hear uh, about quality assurance arrangements uh, of the Qualifica centers in the presentation from Portugal. Important is also transparency of course offers. Um, information on the pricing uh, could be given. And uh, another example could be quality assurance related to education and training of teachers and trainers. And uh, for example, in the Estonian presentation, we will hear about quality assurance of um, curricula and, and teaching, referring also to the um, qualifications of teachers and trainers. So this is just a, uh, should be just a short uh, input on structuring what we are discussing today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the presentations of uh, the three country examples and hand back to Annette. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. I think that was uh, really useful um, to uh, put us in a better place to um, understand uh, or to, uh, let's say, get a bit of a context of what we're going to hear in the country examples. And I'd like to go straight to the first one, which is from Estonia. Um, so Kaya Kumpas-Lenk and Marge Kronmeier will um, present. Um, they are both uh, with the Estonian Quality Agency for Higher and Vocational Education, ECA for short. Um, and they are going to give us um, an insight of what flexible learning pathways mean for quality assurance um, in Estonia. Um, so I will uh, give the floor uh, to Kaya, but um, first um, let me just um, uh, 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 invite all the participants to post um, your questions um, in the chat box. I can see there is already a first question uh, from Brigitte from, uh, from France. So after uh, Kaya and Marcus' presentation, we will have a bit of time um, to answer um, any questions. So please, I think uh, Kaya is going to start, so the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, I'm really happy to present um, uh, the, how the um, flexible pathway can be um, can be uh, shown through the lens of continuing education and the uh, quality assuring of continuing education. But yes, we can go to the next slide and uh, start with the presentation. I think uh, the first thing that we need to um, talk over is that um, what do we mean by continuing education just to clarify the scene and um, for us the continuing education means the provision of purposeful and organized studies on the basis of curriculum outside the formal education for example these trainings or courses or or certificate trainings or, or etc and uh, these uh, training courses can be offered for by different types of institutions in Estonia, for example, in-service training institutions or higher education institutions or vocational education institutions or hobby schools or, or uh, libraries or hospitals or non-profit organizations. So there are so many different institutions who can offer a continuing education and uh, one of them are the VET institutions as well. So if we move to the next slide, just to open the scene, what we're doing regarding to uh, quality assurance uh, in continuing education. So we have quality assurance uh, in higher education, we have institutional accreditations, and there we have uh, one um, standard service to society under which we assess also a bit not thoroughly, but a bit uh, continuing education. And also in VET quality assessment of study program groups, we uh, touch this topic of, of continuing education quality a bit, but not very thoroughly. But um, we understood in Estonia that um, the continuing ed education was always kind of left out. So, so there was a need to develop a system for continuing education as well, because Although we assess formal education institutions, there are lots of institutions that are that, that are not 
um, uh, the formal education institutions and for them we needed this kind of uh, model for continuing education. And so we developed a threshold based quality assessment model for continuing education that also applies to the higher education institutions and uh, vet schools as well. And uh, these are basically the main puzzle pieces that we have today, but we are now thinking and developing uh, the system for micro credentials as well. It's a smaller puzzle piece because it's a baby. It's very, uh, very um, an, an infancy phase, phase, but we try to build now the system that will really uh, smoothly uh, move into the other puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces so that uh, um, the schools will don't don't have too much burden if we implement the micro credentials into quality, quality assurance as well. So we tried to really uh, build up a system that doesn't that that will not be a burden, but we'll see. If we move to the next slide, uh, then um, I would like to talk more about the um, quality assessment of continuing education in Estonia. Uh, we have Adult Education Act that uh, sets the standards for continuing education um, and um, it has several standards. Uh, for example, standards for curriculum, for how to the principle for teaching and uh, and how how uh, what kind of information should be in the um, uh, continuing education uh, institutions web page for example so that it will be easy to choose from different courses and um, we can say that our system is based on trust we have these standards and if an institution wants to uh, offer a course and use public money for it so they have to register in our educational uh, register and just to click uh, uh, and say that yes I fulfill the standards or no I do not so it's just uh, the checkup uh, will be only on the by ticking the boxes whether they agree that they are meeting needs in the standards so there is no regular quality assessment in the sense of in the law that uh, they need to do in uh, continuing education just assuring that they will follow the law but as we have faced um, the reality, the reality is that there are lots of complaints about the trainings, actually. A lot of complaints that the learning outcomes are not met, the, the programs are not very uh, meeting the standards that the learners or the learners have. So um, the ministry initiated a, um, a project uh, and uh, uh, we uh, have now, since 2018, developed um, a quality assessment model that is threshold based. And we now will look at whether the standards in the Adult Education Act, Act are met. And we will see how this market really is. We can move to the next slide. Uh, and there's one more click, click that you can do. Um, and one more, so we have all the information here. And um, if we look more thoroughly to this uh, threshold based quality assessment model where we assess the institutions based on the um, based on the standards in the act, uh, we have a two stages model. So first stage is that we look whether the information required by the act is uh, in the institution's web page and this can be um, the regulations basis for the organization organization of studies or requirements for adult education educators or basic requirements for curriculum and if we see that these requirements are met the information is there then we move to the second stage and then we look more thoroughly into the context and and deeper uh, whether the curriculum is uh, its quality is uh, curriculum qualities there, whether the teaching requirements are met that are in the standards, and then um, we know, um, for example, whether the learning outcomes that the course has, whether they are achievable with the time frame in the study period, because we have had lots of problems that the time period is too short to achieve those learning outcomes that the course advertises. And also the teaching staff has the necessary qualification, study or work experience to carry out the teaching. So these are the different aspects that we look in the second stage. 
just to move to the next slide uh, and put all, please click all the, <laughs> uh, all the information here. Um, we have done this quality assessment in continuing education since 2019. And what we see is that um, now the field is buzzing. Quality has become an interest of topic in continuing education as well, not just in the formal education. And we see that these two stages, uh, threshold based quality assessment model is efficient because after evaluation and re-evaluation, re most of the institutions have improved and passed the assessments. We also see that the trust-based system is not efficient um, and uh, many of the continuing education see the aspects in the law very as formal. They are not meaningful for them. And I think one of the wins in our, um, our assessment uh, in this project is that uh, now we are changing the law to be more meaningful and uh, transparent to the continuing education institution so that the flexible learning pathways can easily more easily happen because if we have quality in continuing education we can provide students or people more easier pathways to more move to formal education institutions and uh, vice versa so we see that this um, this assessment uh, although it's a threshold based assessment it has given a um, a new perspective and the right push to move forward in the quality assessment. And we see that uh, we have to think more about um, instead of just assessing the threshold, we, we should now move forward to the developing a support system and focusing on enhancing the quality of continuing education. But I will give the floor now to Marga, who can uh, Describe how this flexible pathways um, in Estonia, how, how we how we do it <laughs> in, from the vet side. Thank you, Koya. And can you hear me, everybody? Somewhere there is an echo. But... Perfect. We can hear you now, Marga. Thank you. Okay. And please uh, continue with the next slide. And just one click for, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, take uh, a minute or two uh, left. Uh, what does flexibility mean, uh, especially in initial wet, in Estonian context, uh, it means formal wet education. And you can see, and what does, me, what does it mean in the framework of uh, Estonian qualifications as uh, the framework in which uh, our VET providers, they are VET schools, uh, according to initial VET, um, uh, what does it mean for both sides, internal and external uh, quality assurance as well? So we can go to the next and the last slide. <laughs> And again, clicks, there are some animations to be filled the slide. First of all, I can start already. First of all, the flexibility means um, at providers at national level and also at the level of uh, quality evaluations. Uh, it's ECAS role. Um, uh, is the approach to vet curriculum strategy at provider level at vet schools. It means how efficient and effective is the designing of uh, is the curriculum designing, uh, how holistic it is, and how it's uh, linked to the uh, uh, qualification framework levels, levels starting with level two up to level five, which is uh, in Estonian context uh, the highest uh, level for a formal vet. For example, it means that uh, usually 
uh, vet providers, vet schools design their holistic strategy for curriculum, mm, uh, for curriculum strategy, uh, uh, and they provide uh, or they provide the curriculum at the level two, three, up to level five sometimes. For learner side, it means that for learners, it means flexible pathways starting with lower level curriculum and continued in, in higher or highest level of uh, this uh, specialization. For example, uh, starting with cook assistant or kitchen assistant at level two or level three and, and uh, increasing uh, uh, his or her qualification uh, and reach to level five curriculum, uh, for example, uh, master chef or, or uh, master uh, hairdresser or uh, manager of uh, cleaning works, starting with uh, assistant of uh, cleaning works, for example. And, and the second, of course, it uh, talking about the quality assurance internally and externally, it will be evaluated how effective, how, how um, efficient is this strategy, both for learner side and of course to meet uh, uh, needs of uh, labour market. In the learning process of, or in the educational process, uh, it means the flexibility and how it's quality assured. It means that inside the learning process, there are first of all supporting measures for learners, starting with the recognition of prior learning, for example, uh, recognition of prior learning uh, um, from um, lower level. Uh, and also um, there, are, there should be, let's say, some possibilities or pathways if the learner recognise that uh, uh, studying or at, at this concrete level is uh, uh, maybe um, over-assessed <laughs> uh, and, and it's too high, then how is the possibilities and where are the possibilities to change the level to go back or for example there is one example that in in uh, initial formal uh, vet there are also uh, curricula at uh, vocational secondary level and there should be a possibility for learners if the secondary education at the same time is uh, too much for his or her, it means that there is possibility to continue, not drop out uh, at uh, just vocational education level, curriculum at level four, without a secondary um, academic education. Uh, and uh, maybe just one thing more that uh, it means that inside this initial vet or formal vet education, the strategy of vet providers for curriculum designing includes also the possibilities uh, for initial curricula or continuous curricula, sometimes they are increasing the qualification level, sometimes not. It's, it's just uh, some, uh, some skills more or some learning outcomes more. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both. Um, uh, I think that was really useful um, also um, with uh, the background of how that is all um, embedded um, in uh, uh, in the VET system. 
Um, we are a little bit um, over uh, time, but I think we can still um, take um, uh, a couple of uh, questions. So there are already two um, in the chat box. I think the first one from Brigitte um, is more related to, um, to Karin's presentation. Brigitte um, is wondering about the link um, between the transparency of prices and um, flexible pathways. Um, uh, uh, Karin, do you want to uh, respond to that? Yeah, I think so. This this comes from an earlier discussion with the ICAVET network, um, and it's believed that um, flexible uh, the, the quality assurance arrangements should refer to should include or ensure the transparency of training offers. So, what is the content of the offer? What is the also what we have heard from the pre presentation now? From Estonian colleagues. So, what is the uh, the content? What is the uh, qualification of the teachers, trainers, and so on? And this could include also the uh, information about the price, if this is appropriate. It's not always has uh, you not always have to be uh, paid for a training, but um, this could help then the individual learner to make an informed choice uh, to the select also the, uh, the the training offer that fits best. So it's kind of uh, a support for the individual learner. And the, the other question in, in the chat, uh, if I may continue, uh, refers uh, to the conflict of interest between parties. So there is, of course, um, the VET provider to, to be considered. So if you have flexible entrance dates, uh, recognition of um, um, prior learning and so on, um, and also new quality assurance measures. So there's this a new approach and maybe also uh, can be felt as a burden by VET providers or CVET providers. But I would like to, to hand over this question back maybe to, to Kaya. What is the, the reaction of VET providers, CVET providers to the new uh, quality assurance model that you have introduced? Is there some kind of, uh, do you see that there is a conflict of interest, an issue there? Um. There, there is not because they measure different things because in the threshold based uh, model, we really go through uh, the continuing education courses and, and we look whether the basic threshold standards are met. And that this is something that we do not uh, assess when we have this uh, quality assessment uh, in, in vet education. But there's also a question here that um, what happens if, if somebody doesn't pass? And um, for us, it's uh, currently so that uh, if they don't pass, then they don't have the right to offer courses for the public money. They can offer courses when public money is not used, but we, when we use public money, for example, we have unemployed people that really need the skills and uh, uh, for getting their jobs in the labor market. If if these courses don't pass, then then the unemployed people cannot attend in those courses, for example. So this is the restrictions, because if we use this public money, then the quality needs to be there. Yeah. Thanks, Kaya. Um, there are two questions uh, from Kos Konstantinos, I believe. That's a wild guess because I'm also not able to uh, read the Greek alp alphabet. Um, uh, and he wonders if uh, social partners um, are um, involved in the quality assurance assessment process and he also wonders um, if there is an integrated system for the assessment of the uh, QA threshold criteria. And uh, who is best placed to answer that? Is it Kaya? Yes. Uh, um, uh, just to uh, I guess the social partners do you mean the expert who experts who, who evaluate those curriculums. Am I right to understand it like that? The social partners normally refers to employers and trade unions. Yes. Employers and trade unions are part of our uh, teams who assess the quality of the curriculums, for example, because the criteria itself, for example, the learning outcomes are uh, there. The student is able to achieve them in a certain amount of time. This is something that we really need, need to uh, employers to also to look at. And um, yes, the response is yes, <laughs> they are present. They are involved. Yes. 
uh, what okay. was the other question? I do, you want to, Sorry. Uh, uh, do you want to um, expand a little bit before we then move on um, to the Polish case? Do you want to expand a little bit on the integrated system for the assessment? Um, um, we, s we haven't achieved a total integrated system yet, but we are talking uh, now how to do um, how to do it. But we don't have the kind of a really integrated model yet. They are currently separated models, but mm -hmm. the aim is to do an integrated model, and that yeah. is true. Okay. That's interesting. Then maybe we can already note that down as a challenge. <laughs> That's uh, probably also why Konstantinos uh, asked that question. <laughs> um, because we do it, uh, do it through the micro credentials as well, and then we can really merge those systems. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Marge, for your input and for um, answering the questions. And thanks, everybody, um, to submit the questions. That's great. Um, please continue doing so when we have um, the next um, uh, uh, presentation. So can I ask um, Beata to put on um, her camera? Um, Beata. Um, is um, from uh, the Polish uh, Ministry of Education and Science and um, she's with the Department of Strategy, Qualifications and Vocational Education and um, her responsibilities are really um, the initiation, design and preparation of legal regulations in the field of vocational um, education. So Beata is really well placed to give us an insight into the cumbersome process of uh, policy making um, in that area and uh, Beata is going to um, give us um, a little taster of what uh, flexible learning pathways means um, for quality assurance in Poland. Beata, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to present our Polish uh, approach to quality assurance uh, of flexible VAT pathways. And in my presentation, I will uh, give you a brief review of the system of education with special focus on those flexible VAT pathways. A handful of examples of flexibility in acquiring vocational qualifications, both in IVET and CVET, as well as the possibilities of upskilling, reskilling, requalifying at every stage of uh, life and professional career. And uh, finally, I will also concentrate on uh, quality assurance tools and mechanisms which have been developed uh, as part of our um, national educational policy and they are applied in the VET system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here there is a um, diagram showing uh, briefly the educational system in Poland, which is under the direction of the Ministry of Education and Science. Uh, so VET education, the schools are in green boxes, uh, is provided after completion of primary education at secondary and post-secondary non-tertiary levels. Uh, after graduating from primary school, students can enter a three-year stage one sectoral vocational school or a five-year technical secondary school where they, study, where they study to obtain vocational qualifications in a given VET occupation. Uh, graduates of uh, uh, stage one sectoral vocational school can further enhance their knowledge at stage two sectoral vocational school or at a general secondary school for adults starting with the second grade. So even at this point, we can see the flexibility of the system, that there are no dropouts. If they want to continue, but in a different way, on a different path, they can, for example, start working, um, do some practical vocational training at the employers. And for instance, at certain point, if they want to get the diploma, they may um, again enter the schooling system and um, acquire the um, required level of education, for example. Um, for students with intellectual disabilities, um, there is also a VET pathway, 
they can obtain the um, uh, vocational education after primary school at a three year special needs school, which prepares them to work. Uh, that students qualify in a given occupation after taking vocational exams. These are external exams. Uh, they can also take the matura exam, maturity exam, which uh, gives entrance to tertiary uh, education. And uh, at any stage of education, uh, secondary, post-secondary, or even tertiary, or beyond school, students and learners can upgrade their skills and gain new qualifications through vocational qualification courses. They can be, as I said, even beyond schooling system. So this refers to CVET and adult learning also, which is no longer school-based because it has been totally replaced by this very flexible system of vocational courses, which can be organized either by VET schools example by a stage two sectoral vocational school, by post-secondary schools, which where uh, learning is from one to two and a half years. Um, or they can be also organized by other institutions, such as continuing education uh, centers, vocational training centers, in out-of-school forms, um, and provided by other VET providers. So the system is generally very learner oriented and it is also quality assured by the um, uh, um, external exams and by, uh, by the core cur curricula. So generally we have to um, admit at this point that the whole VET system, either IVET or CVET, um, is based on those national core curricula for vocational education. Students and learners upon completion of a school or a course may take an external exam confirming a given qualification conducted under the same conditions and according to the same rules both for IVET and CVET. And upon passing the exam uh, conducted for each qualification separately, learners receive a, a certificate for a given qualification. Uh, and upon uh, also achieving a required level of education on any chosen uh, path, secondary uh, sectoral education, secondary technical education, for example, they may obtain the vocational diploma, which is a validation for the um, for their qualifications. Um, next slide, please. And uh, Yes, that's right. Uh, here we can see how VET occupations are organized and uh, generally the flexibility of the VET system is primarily anchored in the classification of uh, VET occupations in which IVET schools and other VET providers can conduct uh, vocational education. So in the classification, uh, there are there have been distinguished 32 vocational education sectors of industry uh, and uh, VET occupations have been assigned to these sectors where each occupation comprises of one or two qualifications specified for the occupation. So for the time being in our system we have got 223 VET occupations which have been named in this system and 254 qualifications which have been specified, named, uh, distinguished and described for, for the occupations. Um, obviously VET occupations are also in the Polish, uh, assigned to the Polish qualification framework which one-to-one uh, -one corresponds uh, with uh, EQF. Uh, and the system of qualifications spe specified in uh, VET occupation makes the VET pathways very flexible as it opens up different possibilities of upskilling, reskilling, requalifying at every stage of education and uh, professional life. And now I will show you a handful of examples of what flexible VET pathways, pathways mean in practice. So can I have next slide please? Right, this example shows a path of an IVET education in a five-year technical secondary school. So in an occupation on a technical level, which uh, comprises of two qualifications, 
the student in the course of learning acquires qualification one, which here has got the symbol INF02, which means that it has been assigned to the um, uh, vocational sector of information technology uh, and uh, takes a vocational exam in this first qualification. Then he continues studying and acquires qualification number two. Uh, and upon passing a vocational exam in this second qualification and achieving a required level of secondary technical education, he obtains a diploma uh, in this occupation. If we could see the animation, then we will see how uh, on this path of vet education, uh, the vocational qualifications build up and the whole process leads to a vocational diploma on this technical level. That's right, we have got the diploma of uh, in the occupation of an information technology technician, for example. And next slide, please. Uh, then this example shows another path in vet education, vet education, this time combining IVET and CVET, still school-based because uh, the occupation comprising of two qualifications, this time aimed to, uh, assigned to motor vehicle uh, sector, is acquired in uh, stage one sector of vocational school and then stage two sector of vocational school, which can be also designed for CVET students, not necessarily for IVET students. And the students may continue the VET uh, education, um, take vocational exam in qualification one, then qualification two, and upon uh, achieving a required level of sectoral secondary education this time, they obtain the diploma. First, they obtain the diploma in Mm, uh, the mm, occupation of a motor vehicle mechanic and then when they build up the qualifications this leads them to the uh, acquisition of a, a higher diploma uh, and we, if we could see the animation we will see how it again builds up. Yes, and the diploma uh, on the technical level of a motor vehicle technician, for example. Right, thank you. And then next slide, please. Uh, again, this is an example showing a path for uh, IVET and CVET, but this time partly school-based and partly done in this out-of-school form. So the student again acquires, for example, a Q1 uh, qualification. This time is uh, in the um, electrical sector. Uh, takes the vocational exam to obtain a diploma in the occupation on the sectoral level, the diploma of an electrician. But when he goes beyond the schooling system, he can at any stage of his life continue this vet education uh, on a vocational education course to acquire the second qualification upon passing a vocational exam in this uh, qualification. And if he wants to get the diploma, he must uh, achieve a required level of sectoral secondary education, for example, in a general uh, school for adults. Um, so if we sh if we see the animation, then we will uh, we will um, notice how again uh, this builds up to get to give him the higher qualifications and another vocational diploma on a technical level. We could multiply examples of such vet pathway pathways in different vocational uh, qualifications. Um, uh, but generally it shows how the system is um, learner oriented and uh, that there are no dropouts uh, if someone wants to continue his vocation acqu acquisition of vocational qualifications. Um, uh, could I have next slide please? And then um, there is another mechanism which is also based on those qualifications specified in a vocational um, uh, occupation. The division of each qualification, uh, each occupation into qualifications makes it possible to retrain quickly and to acquire new professional qualifications in different jobs. 
So, for example, uh, within related occupations, the same qualifications are often required, which means that a person who obtains related qualifications during school education or uh, in the vocational education, uh, vocational qualification courses, will be able to carry out more than one occupation. For example, here, there is one common qualification on the sectoral level, for example, uh, in the occupation of a machine tool operator. The, op uh, the common qualification is MEC05. And if the student decides to uh, upskill and acquire qualification number two, either in M -O, uh, qualification MEC09 or MEC10, he may go to two different professions. He may become a mechanic technician or, for example, welding technician. Additionally, on this technical level, it is again possible to reskill and requalify by obtaining those cross uh, qualifications. So one student may acquire qualifications in different jobs, different occupations at the same time, for example, or at different moments of his um, um, job career. Uh, and next uh, slide will show a reverse mechanism and those alternative access opportunities, for example, then when we have got uh, specialists in three different occupations uh, with the first qualification in these three different occupations, when they acquire another qualification, which is common for a different profession, they may become specialists and uh, they may re uh, receive the diploma uh, in this qualification. So I would say that this is all in line with ECAVET indicative descriptor that VET programs are designed in such a way so as to allow flexible learning pathways and to respond quickly to changing labor market needs. Uh, this is also uh, in line with principle seven of uh, ACVET um, network. Individuals should, ha should have the opportunity to transfer their groups of learning outcomes validated in one context to another context. And this refers to programs and qualifications. Okay, next slide, please. And now we come to the mechanisms of quality assurance in flexible VET path pathways. The first basic mechanism are uh, is the national core curricula for vet occupations. So the whole vet. Yeah, I'm really sorry, but uh, just a very quick reminder um, of the time. Huh? We, we, it would okay. be great if you would be able to wrap up in, let's say, the next two minutes. Okay. Otherwise, so we're taking away too just much time more, from the three more slides left very quickly. So Thank the whole you. system is based on national core curricula, which are developed to execute uh, common standards in theoretical teaching and practical training. And they are designed for every qualification separately and define sets of expected learning outcomes. The outcomes can uh, cover the areas uh, shown on the slide. And generally, this mechanism goes along with the lines, uh, uh, goes in lines with the ECAVET and indicative descriptor that best qualifications are described using learning outcomes. And qualifications are composed of clearly defined groups of learning outcomes, units and modules. Next slide, please. Uh, another mechanism is assessment and certification. As I said before, IVET students and CVET learners take part in standardized vocational examinations, which confirm their knowledge, skills, competences, which are the crucial validation tools and recognition tools uh, of the um, uh, vocational qualifications. Uh, they are compulsory, they are external, designed by central examination boards and conducted by regional examination boards. Uh, additionally, we have got uh, extramural vocational exams, which are designed for those who want to confirm their vocational qualifications without having to complete additional schooling or courses. And these uh, exams act as tools of recognition of prior learning, because admission to these exams is only for those who have been studying or working for at least two years in a VET occupation in which uh, a given qualification was specified. 
Um, as we can see here, the exams are conducted for each qualification separately. The requirements are based on VETCOR curricula, which set the verification criteria for the learning outcomes. And they are also very important uh, um, comparison uh, mechanisms for uh, different schools and institutions providing VET. And the data uh, which results from the um, uh, comparison may be used by decision makers at the local and national level. And the final slide, please. The, well, the final, I would say, a very important quality assurance mechanism is generally the management admi and administration of that. In our system, it has got three level structure. On national level, the Ministry of Education and Science designs the educational policies, sets legal basis for the guidelines of quality assurance, especially in School Education Act and in such, uh, regu such regulations as pedagogical supervision, regulation of accreditation of continuing education in out-of-school forms. On a regional le level, the quality of education is assured by, by pedagogical supervision and monitoring performed by uh, education superintendents who are the heads of regional education authorities. So they are responsible for assuring, for um, uh, keeping the standards and observing, reporting and giving advice of, on how to improve the education process, how uh, at every level of education. Um, they are also in charge of issuing accreditation to uh, institutions providing that following a very thorough analysis of its functioning. And on district level, uh, local authorities are responsible for quality assurance because they in fact establish the schools and they govern the schools. There is also one more aspect, the uh, involvement of social partners, for example, employers or other um, partners. Uh, in the School Education Act, it has been stated that there is an obligatory cooperation of schools and employers. For example, in the process of designing school programs, modification curricula, in recommending changes in that system. So generally, it's also in line with the in, in ECAVET uh, descriptors, um, the cooperation with social partners, VET providers and other relevant stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beata, for this uh, really clear and uh, interesting um, presentation. Um, unfortunately, um, we won't have a terrible lot of time to discuss um, the questions, but um, I can see there are a number of questions um, here in the chat box for you. Would you, can you access the chat box? Would you be able maybe to respond to Isabel and uh, Brigitte um, directly? That would be great. Um, uh, I think everybody can follow uh, the conversation there. Then those of you that are also interested um, to hear what Beata has to say to these questions um, can just um, read up here um, because then I would um, just um, uh, uh, directly hand over um, to the next presentation um, from uh, Portugal, Alexandra Teixeira. Um, is the head of department uh, for um, adult qualification department at uh, ANCAP um, and she is responsible for um, supervising and coordinating the activities um, uh, uh, related to the design and development of qualification offers for adults and she's also involved um, in monitoring the Qualifica uh, uh, program, which um, I think we will hear a little bit about um, in your input. Um, thank you, uh, Alexandra, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, I may start uh, uh, to give a brief explanation and I, I would like best to pass to the other slide, please. Thank you. So uh, I'll start to give a very brief explanation on uh, what uh, we, uh, we call the national qualification system. Uh, well, in Portugal, the VET system is centrally governed by the ministries uh, responsible for education and labor. 
and in some parts other sectoral ministries are involved in the process. Uh, the national qualification system was created in 2007 and updated in 2017. Uh, and uh, the main intention was to reform the VET within the education system and within the labor market by establishing the common objectives, tools and structures. So it was put in place to to have a common uh, uh, overarch uh, on the, the VET issues. Uh, the main objectives of the national qualification system uh, uh, are to um, to put to set as a reference objective the upper secondary education uh, that is what we consider the minimum level of education uh, that uh, uh, is important to increase the qualification the level of qualification of the population uh, so I already mentioned the integration of a general education and professional training system uh, and uh, as one of the most important objectives I believe is the legibility and comparability at the national qualifications, especially to the labor market. So, as an example, um, it was created uh, uh, in 2007 a patronized type of certificates uh, uh, with the objective that all relevant actors uh, could uh, understand what the certificates uh, meant to, to, to refer. Also, one of the important, uh, uh, very important objective was to promote the VET flexibility. Also, as an example, it was uh, created back then the possibility to to put set to set in place the the partial certification, and the the um, having that as a, a part of a, a longer uh, way of certification. Also, uh, support school and professional certification via the non-formal and formal, informal learning. Uh, we call it the RVCC process, that is to say, recognition, validation and certification of competences. And all this, of course, with the main objective to increase responsive, responsiveness to labor market needs. Sorry for my bad English this morning. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, um, I, uh, over here, I just illustrated the, the main structures and the instruments that uh, are uh, under direct responsibility of UNCAP uh, and uh, that integrate the national qualification system, that is the national qualification catalogue. I would like to, to point out that integrates 391 qualifications and uh, more recently integrates also several shorter pathways, uh, training pathways. Um, as, a, as an example, I'll, I'll, we are developing now under the, the National Catalogue of Qualifications, the design of uh, uh, digital competences programs, just as an example. Also, uh, another important structure in the in the our system are the sector councils for qualifications. They are there are 18 sector councils. They integrate uh, representatives of different sectors, um, representatives of the employers and workers as well, also specialists uh, and. Uh, they are the base of the validation of the qualifications that integrate the national catalogue of qualifications. Um, one of the structures that I will focus a little bit more ahead are the qualification centres uh, and uh, besides that we also have the Quality Assurance uh, ECAVET uh, that have a base of uh, specialists uh, and uh, they are in the UNCAP uh, more focused on the, the VET uh, for the young people. Um, and uh, we have uh, uh, now in, uh, under development a new um, start for the quality assurance for adults that I will present you ahead. Could you please pass to the next slide? Thank you. So I'll focus now on the qualification centers. Uh, the qualification centers 
are specialized centers in, in education and training of adults. They were set up under the scope of Qualifica program, uh, but uh, uh, in fact, they heritage the, the uh, what we called in 2007 the uh, new opportunity uh, uh, centers uh, under the scope of another program we had back then. Uh, now we have a network that integrates 310 uh, qualifica centers that are promoted by several different type of entities like public or private schools, uh, vocational training centers, municipalities, enterprises, uh, local development associations and so. Uh, these these uh, qualifica centers, uh, they, they have the test to promote provide information, guidance, and referral adults uh, to either RVCC process uh, or education and training pathways. So uh, these, these process, um, uh, these R, uh, RVCC process or education and training pathways, they are referred, they have referrals, they have standards, sorry, under the national uh, uh, catalog for qualifications uh, that I've spoke a while ago. Uh, the qualifica centers play a key role in motivating adults for lifelong learning and uh, we see them as the main entrance of adults in the, the VET system and in, under the, the, the achievement of a better qualification. So, uh, RVCC uh, process are only developed by qualified centers, uh, and I would like to stress this because they have specialized teams on the RVCC, and, uh, and they uh, they, are, they allow the, the certif to certify prior learning, as I, I said a while ago. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, now we are under the development uh, and uh, going back to the issue of quality assurance in the adult uh, that um, we are now putting in place what we call the, the quality charter for qualifica centers. And uh, this quality charter is uh, oriented by, uh, mainly by these uh, four guiding principles to ensuring the high performance of qualifica centers in the qualification of adults, improve effectiveness and efficiency by orienting activity to results, uh, that is to, to stress the importance of the, the qualifica work, uh, the qualifica centers work be centered in the needs of the individuals, of the adults, also to encourage the autonomy and responsibility of qualifica centers that is a very important aspect for us too they have to see themselves as able uh, uh, to to be uh, to develop a, a proactive um, way of dealing with the, the adults uh, not just expecting the adults to go with them to 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 go uh, meeting them and also another important guiding principle is to promote self-assessment and continuous improvement of the activity of qualifica centers. That is to say they have, they have to see themselves as a continuous uh, process, in a continuous process of qualification of adults. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, the, the Qualifica Charter um, have uh, these uh, three main intervention dimensions. One that uh, is under the direct responsibility of ANCAP is what we call the monitoring by the regional monitoring teams. These teams integrate uh, people from ANCAP but also from other relevant uh, uh, public entities, that is the JEST and IEFP, those are the, sorry, those are the, the main, the main uh, uh, entities responsible for the uh, Institute of Employment and Vocational Training and also a directorate, directorate general for the uh, uh, school establishments. So those are the, those two uh, um, entities that uh, we then kept uh, are are responsible for the monitoring 
of the, the Qualifica centers. And this monitoring uh, goes under a permanent monitoring that is continuous uh, across all over the year. Uh, it integrates uh, a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of execution of, and results of the Qualifica centers. Uh, the regional moni monitoring teams are also responsible to provide specific guidelines adapted to the reality of each center because they have uh, they are uh, in different parts of the Portuguese territory with different needs and the different um, economic uh, tissue. And also, uh, uh, they they have a strong formative component. They they they, they are very uh, 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 during the year. Uh, they they are developing a lot of meetings with different qualifica centers. Um, also. Um, Another dimension that is not yet set in place, but we are now under the develop under development, and are what of the sorry. Um, they are um, uh, we are going to to put in place what we call the the audits. Uh, that is to say, there will be an external team that uh, will do punctual assessment based on a sample defined on a regional criteria and the type of promoting uh, the entities. And finally, as I mentioned a while ago, as one of the principles, there is a, a dimension rela related to the self-assessment uh, by the Qualifica centers that is already existing, exists. Uh, it's an ongoing evaluation and is reflected in annual reports that the Qualifica centers have to deliver to one cap and they are uh, when they deliver them uh, they are analyzed by uncap and we give some feedback on that uh, evaluation and finally for the final <laughs> slide please thank you so we are develop developing a set of indicators and reference standards um, we have uh, made uh, some organization in input factors, process factors and output factors. And the input factors um, include aspects like the, the ability of the qualification centers to the mobilization of adults, the constitution, allocation and stability of teams, including qualification of teachers and trainers that, that uh, belong to those teams the adequacy and facilities and equipment of the centers, the organization and functioning of the centers. For instance, they have to be flexible on the, the schedule. They have to, to, to have uh, the adults, to, to work with adults, because many of those adults are in the labor market. Uh, concerning process factors, uh, we, we consider aspects like planning and development of activities with adults, application of reference and technical guidelines in working with adults, also strategies adopted for individualized follow-up appropriate to adults profile. That is an important aspect because qualification centers have to incorporate the idea that they are also responsible after the, the, the adults going to meet them to, to give some uh, guidance uh, besides uh, that, that moment. That is to say, if they are referral uh, some adults to a training pathway, it's important that the qualification center um, um, don't lose the adults. Uh, that is to say, uh, that uh, as to know if effectively the, that adult concluded the, 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 the training pathway, for instance. Also, uh, other kind of dimension, um, sorry, other kind of indicators that, that we call the output factors. It's the ongoing evaluation reflected in the uh, annual reports. That is to say, the, um, the regional monitoring team, they, they, each year they produce a, a report that reflects the evaluation they have made uh, across the year on the qualification centers they have monetized. And finally, uh, under the, the quality chart of qualification centers, we think it's also important to, to the establishment of reference for procedures and results. It's a kind of benchmarking. 
Uh, so uh, we are uh, trying to def define standards through examples of good practice. Like uh, we have, uh, we would like to, well, give a more or less a, a label of centers of excellence. Those are the the, the reference standards we would like to 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 put in the system for the all qualification centers to to be possible to follow. So thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra, for this uh, really interesting um, input. Um, I think uh, we learned a lot um, about uh, the Qualifica centers and uh, the challenges that you um, addressed there. So I appreciate we're already reached, um, let's say time-wise, uh, the end of the webinar. And um, there are probably many of you that have um, ensuing commitments and cannot um, stay uh, with us for uh, much longer. So um, uh, thank you for joining. Um, uh, if you have to log off uh, immediately, um, but um, those that can maybe spare um, another uh, 10 minutes. Um, it would be great if you would um, still stay with us. Um, uh, maybe, um, Alexandra, I can see there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do like we did with Beata, that you um, address them uh, directly there. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I would still, before we um, uh, close um, the meeting, I would still like to give uh, Karin a short um, opportunity um, to summarize um, a couple of observations um, and just um, uh, try and put things a little bit into perspective. Um, Karin, please. Thank you, Annette. Uh, and, and thank you also for not asking me to present conclusions because this is really difficult. First of all, I would like to thank the, the presenters for their uh, the in insights they provided into their systems, flexible pathways, quality assurance. I think we have heard uh, a couple of very interesting um, practices here. Um, well, what maybe one observation that I think is quite important is that uh, these individual and flexible pathways, having them uh, together uh, with um, clear standardized or standards uh, developed at national level seems to be important. So these national standards seem to provide the framework and it doesn't mean that having flexible pathways, individual learning pathways means that uh, just everything goes. So this seems to be important. Other um, aspects, observations I would like to make is I would like to refer to some aspects that we probably could uh, consider addressing in the future here in, in the ECAVET uh, network. Uh, for example, um, there is always this question on terminology and concepts. What do we mean when we talk about partial qualifications? What does it refer to? I think there are clarifications still needed. Uh, a challenge that was addressed is uh, we have a quality assurance uh, for VET, for IVET, and for quality assurance arrangements for CVET, for adult learning. But how can this be an integrated uh, system? So this could be also further discussed. Questions also from the chat refer to who is involved in, in quality assurance. So who are the stakeholders? Are social partners involved so for ensuring uh, flexible pathways that also combine learning in the, at the workplace and coming back then to educational institutions and so on? So there might be also other uh, forms of cooperation needed. Then also coming back to one question that said in the chat on how to deal with conflicts of interest. Um, are there trade-offs uh, necessary? How to organize actually at, at provider level then uh, the um, uh, flexibility of, of VET pathways for individual learners? So this is an, I think, how to organize it and also how to quality assure this then is quite important. And then maybe a final aspect that could also be um, addressed in the future and uh, it refers also to, to a question in chat and what uh, we just heard from Portugal, the monitoring. So how many, who actually is using, how many learners are using flexible pathways? So how can, what kind of methods, what kind of measures can we use for monitoring um, the use of flexible pathways? So these are just uh, a quick uh, summary of some aspects that I think um, are 
that we could consider in the future also for discussing in another event. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karin. That's always a challenge uh, to kind of draw conclusions uh, uh, on your feet, so to say. So thank you for that. Um, indeed, I also um, have the impression that there is really a lot uh, to discuss and um, the, the topic is quite complex um, and uh, uh, equally um, ways of quality assurance um, are uh, uh, multifold um, and very interesting um, to discuss discuss, but um, we're already uh, running out of time, um, already a little bit over time actually. So um, uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much um, for joining um, in this um, super busy uh, period. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, and um, just um, to, uh, to finalize, uh, I would like to uh, wish you all um, the very best um, for the time to come. And I hope you have um, a, a very nice um, a Christmas time and uh, end of year time. And maybe just um, as a final um, uh, a quick little um, activity. Uh, we would just like to know what is Santa Claus uh, called in your country. So if you would share that with us um, in the chat box, um, just so that we get a little insight into the different um, into the different uh, uh, customs there, that would be nice. Um, actually, here in Belgium, um, there is. Um, uh, there are two uh, people active in that um, uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, we have um, uh, 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 the Kerstmann. This is the person that uh, brings all the gifts um, for Christmas, and we have um, Santa Claus, who is coming on sixth of um, December. So these are two different people, and uh, one has to make sure that they don't uh, overlap. So there is a strict, uh, uh, let's say, regime. Uh, uh, to keep them uh, separate. So yeah, thank you very much. Oh, this is now going, <laughs> going a little bit. Uh, 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 um, there's still um, people discussing, but uh, we can see there are Weihnachtsmann or Christkind in Germany. So in, Christ in Germany, there's also this um, separation. And uh, yeah, Per Noel, he who who, who only comes on the 2nd of December, if I understand that um, correctly. Yeah, so we can see the traditions are, um, are quite similar, although um, they have um, they have their um, they have their regional um, and local um, color. Yeah, on the 24th. <laughs> Thanks, Brigitte, uh, for clarifying that. So, yeah, um, uh, uh, of course, there is also um, a feedback form. So this was um, the first ECAVED webinar, and we would really like to, um, to know what you thought of it um, and whether we should do that um, more often um, uh, uh, in the same way or maybe in a different way. So any feedback um, that, you would, um, that you would have for us um, is much appreciated. Uh, my colleague uh, Corinne just posted um, the link um, in the chat box and I believe we will also send it through uh, with um, our uh, follow-up email. So um, yeah, thank you very much um, and uh, yeah, enjoy the holidays and we'll all meet again, I'm sure, um, over the course of um, next year. So the ECAVET uh, work program will be um, distributed um, very shortly uh, following um, the Christmas break so that you know um, what is um, on the agenda um, for um, the next year. Thank you so much and bye-bye. Um, Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.